So tell me, what is lingerie? Lingerie is anything that a woman would wear underneath her clothing or to sleep in. So it can be sleepwear, it can be underwear, it can be slips, things like that. There are so many lingerie terms, it can be really hard to keep track. For example, what is the difference between a chemise and a camisole? That's a great question. A chemise was actually a, a kind of a slip, a straight form dress worn in the, it's, they've been worn for a long time, but in the 20s especially, you can think of a chemise, very straight with very thin straps and um, formless. And that was, it didn't have any shorts or underwear attached to it. And then a camisole is shorter. So a camisole was really just a shortened chemise that you would wear. So it would have the same thing, the straps, and then it would be cropped to about your waist. We have a lot of pieces in our collection that you refer to as hostess gowns. Mm -hmm. What are hostess gowns and can you tell me about the history behind them? Hostess gowns were really worn in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. They could be anything from a jumpsuit to a gown to a robe, but they were designed so that if someone stopped by to visit, you could see them, you could have them come in. You weren't in your see-through lingerie or your, or your negligee. You were wearing something that was presentable for company. And a lot of women spent more time at home in those days. A lot of women were not working, and so they were at home and they wanted to wear something that wasn't sleepwear, so they wanted to wear something pretty. That's why some of the hostess gowns that we have look like clothing. They look like something you would wear out to dinner because they're so well made. What is a peignoir? Well, peignoir, actually the word itself means to comb. And so women used to have dressing tables and dressing areas, full dressing areas. Today, that sounds crazy to most women, use your bathroom sink, but they would have a separate area where they would sit and comb or brush their hair. And that was considered a ritual. You would have your hair usually worn up and then you would take it down and you would spend hours brushing your hair. And the peignoir was to be worn over whatever you were wearing and it was to protect whatever you're wearing from the hair that was falling off. Then it evolved into being a robe, and usually they are loose, very loose. They're not the tight-fitting robes, and they usually just have one tie or a couple of buttons at the top. They're not buttoned all the way down. That's when it's called a robe. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's it's the closures. That's the, the closures and just the fit. It's super flowy, and you know the 1960s and 50s nightgowns that are made of chiffon and are very airy and they have the peignoir on top of a nightgown. Those are called peignoir sets. That's the look that it eventually evolved into. Originally, they were made out of lace or silk or other materials, but the ones that we think of today usually are kind of those 50s Doris Day type sets. How do vintage bras differ from modern day bras? They differ greatly. And as a matter of fact, women have been making their own version of a bra since the beginning of time. It wasn't until 1914 that a woman named Mary Jacobs was getting ready for her debutante ball. And she noticed that her corset cover and the corset with the boning was sticking out of her dress and she didn't like it. And so she said, somebody bring me two handkerchiefs and some pink ribbon. And she made the very first American bra. She called it a backless bra. Brazier. The bra became so popular that strangers were asking her to make them a version. And so she actually patented the design and started a company making them. And it was a business for a while until she sold the patent. What really made the bra popular was during World War I when there was a metal shortage. And so they needed all the metal they could find and use for ships and building ships. And the government asked women to stop buying corsets. So women stopped buying corsets, and that's really when people started thinking about other things to wear. Then from that point on, the bra took on various changes. So in the 1920s, you've, you can see the what we call a bandeau, really, but it was a very flat piece of silk fabric that sometimes would attach to the upper part of a corset, sometimes would just be worn with ribbons attached, almost like a very mini camisole bra size. And that became popular. And you can imagine flappers wearing those because that was the perfect style for a flapper. And then in the 30s, they introduced cup sizes because before that, all bras were one size. And so you just had to get small, medium, or large. Then they started to introduce the cups. In the 1940s, a man named Frederick Mellinger, and you would know him today, his name from Fredericks of Hollywood. He was the first to introduce a padded bra, a push-up bra, and a front closure bra. So that was when the bra became sexualized. We started to think of bras as being something that would show cleavage rather than something that was used to support your body. And so that really changed the whole trajectory of the bra. And then the movies started to really take advantage of that. And all of the movie stars started to wear bras that were really, really dramatic until the 50s. And in the 50s, 
bullet bra was introduced, which was very pointed to fit into the very pointed darts that were sewn into the clothes. And so the bra has gone through huge changes. In the 60s and 70s, women stopped wearing bras to protest against women being objectified. And so the bra really tells a lot about the history of women and the history of undergarments. Modern day bras, really the, the most revolutionary things that have happened have been mem memory foam. The Wonder Bra was actually introduced in the 60s. Most people think it was the 80s, but the 80s popularized it, but it was the 60s when it was first invented. And then memory foam and different types of not using wire anymore, because for a long time you had to have wire. That was just required for a bra. And they've become more comfortable. The sports bra is now something people will wear daily. So bras have really changed, and a lot of people believe they'll be obsolete someday. People are also more comfortable now wearing sheer clothes without bras. And they're starting to really try to normalize that, which I think would be wonderful. How does vintage lingerie compare in quality to modern day made pieces? The biggest difference I see in modern lingerie is that a lot of it's made of polyester. And polyester is not a breathable fabric. And so when you sleep in it, it's not comfortable. You will sweat. It will be uncomfortable to trap heat in your body. If you sleep in cotton, you'll be cooler. And if you sleep in silk, you'll be cooler. And 1920s and 1930s mostly used silk, and you'll see a lot of beautiful silk, some of the prettiest lingerie ever made, and the prettiest sleepwears from the 1920s and 1930s. In the 1940s, they went to rayon because that was more sustainable during wartime. And then in the 1950s and 60s, we saw really a surge in nylon, a lot of nylon, a lot of different blends of nylon. There still was some silk being used, but it was rare. And then once the 70s came, it became more polyester. And so I find just sleeping in polyester just constrictive and uncomfortable. And it's really nice to have a natural fiber that allows your body to breathe when you're sleeping. You'll also find in vintage lingerie, beautiful embroidery, really delicate laces. You'll find satin trim. You'll find a fit that's just incredible. You'll find cut on the bias. Some that even look like they're evening gowns. A lot of our clients will choose to wear 1930s bias cut nightgowns as wedding gowns because they're so beautiful. And they actually are sometimes more beautifully made than modern day wedding dresses. We have a lot of lingerie from the 1920s. What is unique about pieces from that era? The 1920s pieces were probably some of the finest made and the silk is just so beautiful and so delicate. A lot of the lingerie was a reflection of the fashions at the time. And so women were wearing gowns like the 1920s nightgowns out to dinner, just of a little thicker satin fabric rather than that fine silk. And so you can see a reflection of fashion, whereas today you don't really see that as much. You don't see a reflection of what's happening on the street or on the runway in your lingerie. But in those days you did. Do you have a favorite lingerie piece from our collection? I have a couple of favorite pieces. One of my favorites is a vintage white 1920s embroidered nightgown with a low V. I personally collect Claire Potter clothing. She was a very important 1950s female designer in America. And we have two of her robes and her, they're more like penoirs, but they're just beautiful. They're beautiful, vibrant colors. And they look as if they were made today, but made of the finest silk. At the time, Claire Potter was so unique because people saw these bright pops of color that they haven't seen before in fashion because fashion in those, in those days was pretty subdued. And a lot of the hues were really moderate and neutral. And then she came out with these beautiful, bold prints and these bright, really saturated colors. They weren't subtle. And it really stood out. And that's what I love about her pieces. One of the things I love. How has lingerie influenced everyday fashion? Lingerie has influenced fashion, most notably in the 1980s. Jean-Paul Gaultier used both the corset and a form of the bullet bra, his modern version of the bullet bra, on Madonna. And Alaya used versions of the corset. The corset has been an inspiration for most designers. Thierry Mugler uses the corset. There isn't a designer who hasn't really used it either on the inside of their garments or on the outside. And so that's one of the big influences. In the 1990s and early 2000s, the slip dress became really popular. A lot of designers took the basic slip, just added a different fabric, a different print. And it was really, a lot of them even had adjustable straps. Dolce and Gabbana often had adjustable straps on their dresses. And so you'll see the influence of slips, bras, corsets, and even a lot of designers produced two-piece outfits that look very much like pajamas, even made in silks and in florals. So you look like you're wearing pajamas, but just a little bit more substantial. Are there any lingerie designers that you believe deserve more recognition? Who is your favorite? Just about every 
fashion designer in the 60s and 70s especially, produced a line of lingerie, whether it be undergarments or sleepwear. Christian Dior, uh, Bob Mackie did a collection for Glidden's lingerie company. So all the designers did their pieces, but I particularly am fond of a designer named Sylvia Pedler. And she was the designer for a company called Iris Lingerie. And that company was known as the premier lingerie company of the 1940s and 50s, especially. And in the 1940s, if you went into a home that had a lot of money, a lot of wealth, they would most definitely have Iris Lingerie. Because she was the creative director and the designer, she didn't get as much attention. And I've always wanted to see her get her accolades for being one of the first female lingerie designers, because a lot of the times they were designed by men. Hers were made with beautiful fabrics. The lace doesn't shrivel, the fabric doesn't shred. And so we always like it when we find a designer or a manufacturer who makes things to last. That's what vintage is really all about being able to wear things that are old and have been worn by someone else, but they look as if they were bought today. What are some of the more luxe vintage lingerie companies that someone might want to look for when buying vintage lingerie? Well, I think that it depends on the era. And so a lot of people love Vanity Fair because Vanity Fair made just about every slip in the mid 20th century. I particularly love Heavenly Silk Lingerie from the 1940s and they made beautiful silk slips. Some of the prettiest we've ever had have been from Heavenly Silks. Whenever we acquire a prominent estate of clothing, we always see pieces like Aura Fetter, Iris Lingerie, we'll see Heavenly Silks. So whenever we see those, we know that these people bought the best of the best. And so those are some of the ones to look for. Glidden's Lingerie, some of the older pieces are really beautiful. And um, some of the ones that are custom made are some of our favorites. The important thing is to look for quality, fabrics, some interesting details, whether it be lace or embroidery or inset lace or inset ribbons, something that makes it unique and look for condition. If you're buying a piece of silk, make sure there's no shredding because if shredding starts, you can't stop it. Just be aware that the price should reflect that because you won't be able to wear it for a long time. If you're using it for display or for study, which oftentimes we will sell pieces for that purpose, that's a different story because you're using it to understand how vintage lingerie was made. Another brand that I really love, and they typically made hostess gowns and pajama sets, would be Dynasty, which was a company in Hong Kong that custom made silk products for people. So you could go and have something made. You would go to the factory even. And um, they, they made some of the most beautiful silk sets. And some of our favorite lingerie pieces came from an estate we had from a woman who had lived in Shanghai, China in the 1930s. And it was hand, everything was handmade and hand embroidered and some of the most beautiful work we've seen. What was the whole point of a slip? Well, slips were originally made to wear under sheer dresses or under wool dresses because wool can be itchy. And so oftentimes when you buy a suit, a vintage suit, you'll notice that the front of the skirt might be lined, but not the back. And they try to make skirts to be more comfortable. And sometimes like in the forties, they're not lined at all. Some were, but some were not. And so women would wear slips. They'd wear half slips if they're wearing a skirt and a full slip if they're wearing a dress. And then in the 50s, the crinoline became popular to get that exaggerated shape. And so that was a different take on slips. That was a made of tulle, netting, sometimes very, very stiff. Then in the 60s, women still wore them. Really through the 70s, some, and some into the 80s, women were wearing slips. And even now, I think people wear a different type of slip, like you know the stretch type of slips or the strapless ones that are made of knit material. It's just sometimes you need that undergarment. So there are variations on the slip. The teddy is really a similar idea to the slip. It was really invented to be a slip with underwear. So it was one piece, so it had everything in it. And then the same is true of a bodysuit. You wouldn't need a bra and you wouldn't need underwear. It's all one piece. And a lot of those pieces were just for women to feel more confident under their clothing. We have a lot of little silk shorts in our collection. What are those called? Those are called tap pants. And those were worn in the 1940s, mostly. And they would have a matching bralette, a very lightweight silk usually, sometimes rayon, and they're really beautiful. They're almost short length, what we would consider shorts now. There were bloomers that were made. They were kind of a variation on a bloomer and not quite underwear that we know today in between. You would wear those similarly to the way you would wear a half slip, but really it was underwear. You, you might still wear a slip over the whole outfit, but it was the replacement for underwear. Tell me about vintage shapewear. Well, shapewear, again, goes back to the corset, as everything does in lingerie, pretty much. And the full corset was what women wore originally, which would kind of push their breast up and out of their clothing. You've seen that in Renaissance pictures. 
And then they invented something called the split corset. So there would be a bra on top that would attach to the corset that was kind of like a waist cincher that would also have attachments for hosiery. That evolved to people having girdles instead of corsets and then wearing hose with the attachments from the girdle, from the bottom of the girdle. There were also waist cinchers, which don't attach to hosiery and are just meant to cinch your waist, which also John Paul Gaultier used in his designs. So shapewear has been around forever. It's changed a lot just because it's become more comfortable. You now see girdles that are made of a much more flexible material. You feel like your skin can breathe in them a little bit better. Pantyhose having control top during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, that was a big thing. Now it's women wearing shapewear on all sorts of forms. Even slips now are shapewear. So shapewear has evolved a lot. There's no longer a whalebone corset. It's definitely still something that women want. So a lot of these pieces like bed jackets, people don't wear those anymore. How could someone style that today to make it look modern? Well, I, th I think it depends on the piece. Some of the bed jackets that we have, we have some that are made of really fine lace and really beautiful silk. You could wear over a dress, over a blouse. You could wear it as a blouse. There are a lot of ways to reutilize and reinvent vintage lingerie to make it modern and to make it contemporary by mixing it with things that you already own. And so the slips are easy because slip dresses are slips. And we have a lot of patterned slips that look just like dresses and can be worn as dresses. The bed jackets can be really fun because some of them are knit and they look like sweaters and they can be worn like sweaters. Bed jackets were worn when someone would come and visit you and you were in bed and you wanted to cover up your nightgown. And so women would put those on in the hospital or after they had a baby when they had visitors and they'd come in and they would be covered. They were made of a variety of materials starting probably in the early 1900s. So the finer ones are silk and lace, and then they move into knit and polyester and nylon, all different types of fabrics. A lot of the hostess gowns can be worn as dresses, for sure. We recommend that a lot. They're beautiful. They're made as well, if not better, than a lot of modern clothing. And so some of them are jumpsuits, which are really fun. We have some that look like robes, but when you put them on, they have a belt, so it cinches the waist, and it's perfect to wear as a dress. So anytime you have a soft, really fine fabric like silk or lace, if you combine it with something that has texture or, or weight to it. So if you're using a leather or a, if you have a silk blouse and you want to put it with something chunky or something heavy or something with density, it just makes it more relevant today. It makes it modern. It helps it fit into your modern wardrobe a little bit better. If you try to wear it as it is, it will look vintage, which some people love and that's great. But if you want to make it look modern, you want to mix it with some materials that are unexpected. 